444-6240. And for more information concerning other water issues in the West, visit the Water Education Foundation's website at www.water-ed.org. Funding for setting a course for the California Bay Delta is provided by the Water Education Foundation with additional support from the following organizations. CalFed Bay Delta Program, California Urban Water Agencies, Central Valley Agriculture, Hans and Margaret Doe Charitable Trust, the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, Lehman Brothers, The Nature Conservancy, and State Water Contractors. Broadcasting from Orange County, this is KOCE. Expand your mind. Relive the days of World War II with the classic series, Danger UXB. Dramatic tales of courageous young men who risk their lives. Why waste three months training a bloke at Noct 2 to be an officer when his expectation of life in this lark is only seven weeks? Disarming German bombs that rained on England. <laughs> a story of unsung heroes, stolen moments, and a world turned upside down. Danger UXB, Sunday at 8. On the next Taggart, more legends of the 60s band The Adders turn up dead. Secrets start to surface about their past. Well, it certainly wasn't all Lovins and LSD, that's for sure. Meanwhile, the surviving members have secrets of their own, and a young singer gets a break. To the new Janie. But at what price? Don't miss part two of Legends on Taggart, Sunday at 10 on KOCE. Growing up in uh, Yonkers, New York, I was part of the first generation that did not have an involvement with the river. You know, we, we lost it, but it made me want to find my, my roots in the river, you know, what the river meant to me. And what I discovered was that great feeling of ownership and that feeling of belonging, you know, that the, the river belongs to me, I belong to the river. When you think about PBS, it's very much the same thing. You know, you belong to it, it belongs to you. It's a place where you can rediscover things about yourself and about your community and about your roots. My first exposure to nature was via television. And the pioneer in bringing nature into the homes of us city kids uh, was, uh, was public television. One of the things I saw in the past two years, which was just, which was terrific, was uh, Kevin Klein's production of Hamlet, which was done as a very contemporary production of Hamlet. I'm not a big Shakespeare buff by any means. I'm not, I'm not well versed in the theater or drama, but boy, this captured my imagination. It's worth remembering that uh, PBS was the pioneer of nature broadcasting, was the pioneer of different kind of news broadcasting, was the pioneer of live performance broadcasting. They were, will continue to be the pioneer of new kinds of broadcasting. Monday on KOCE, adventures near and far. At 8, we hit the road with Antiques Roadshow. We're heading to the city of brotherly love, Philadelphia. Here experts look at silver and jewelry, fine paintings and furniture, and objects from the great Pennsylvania German tradition. Then at 9, World of National Geographic. In 1960, Jane Goodall came to the African forest to study the elusive wild chimpanzee. She was destined to make scientific history documenting the complex animals most like mankind. Today, her work, through others, lives on. An awesome portrait of life among the wild chimpanzees. Finally at 10, it's time to be making tracks. Explore the wonders of travel by train as a pair of rails take you on a pathway of discovery across the European continent. Antiques Roadshow, National Geographic, and Making Tracks, a night of fascinating adventures, Monday on KOCE. Hi, coming up next on Wood Carving, we'll be putting the finishing details on our American Eagle. So don't go away.
Come on in. My name is Rick Boots. Welcome to Wood Carving. Today we're going to be putting on the finishing details of the American Eagle that we started last week. And what I've done in the meantime is I've gone through and finished establishing our levels that we talked about in our relief carving. As you may remember, one of the things we talked about was in starting a relief carving, you want to figure out your carving so that the high spots, like the talons, appear the highest in the carving. And then progressively they get lower and lower down. And you want to establish all these general shapes, like the curve of the scroll and the tail, before you begin doing the details. And that's what I've done here. I've gone through and established all of our major shapes here. And now we can start doing our details. One of the more interesting things with the eagles is carving the feathers. And what I've done is just kind of sketch those in from the pattern, and then it's just a matter of carving them. There's a couple of ways you can do it, but the easiest way is to take a macaroni gouge and just incise along the edge. Now the macaroni gouge is kind of interesting because it's kind of box shaped. And you have a much flatter, broader surface at the bottom than the V-tools that we've been using, which are pretty much just a sharp V. The nice thing about this is we can go along and we can bevel that down a little bit and we can make a cut that shows the outline of the feather and lowers the section next to it to make it look like it's overlapping feathers. And we can do that with one cut. This will save you a lot of time. Now, I didn't worry too much about the outline of the feathers at the bottom of the wings. I just cut that out and left that kind of smooth and general. When I get the feathers carved in, then I can go through with a knife and just round off those bottoms. And that makes it a lot easier than if you're trying to match your feathers to lines that were already cut in the bottom of the, uh, of the wing there, of the edge. The thing to remember about feathers is that they overlap each other kind of like shingles on a roof. And the ones on top overlap the ones in the row next to it and on down until you get down to the bottom edge. Don't worry too much about making the feathers exactly like the ones in the pattern. This was something that the old wood carvers generally used a lot of their own interpretation on. And sometimes they just kind of go with the flow as to how, as to how they work out in conjunction with the shape of the wing. Now, as we mentioned last week, this carving with the slogan, Free Trade and Sailor's Rights, was from the War of 1812. And one of the big problems that Americans had with the War of 1812 was, well, there'd been wars going on between France and England and all those countries have been warring for so long that uh, America was trying to stay out of getting in these squabbles. And one of the problems was the British ships needed manpower and not only would they harass the American vessels and maybe confiscate the uh, cargo or confiscate the ships sometimes I guess if they could get away with it, they would also impress the sailors, and that's not like uh, making them go, wow. They would actually Shanghai them and say, hey, you're a British seaman. The rationale for that was a lot of the, uh, they thought a lot of British seamen were on American ships. So theoretically, they were just collecting deserters. Well, a lot of them weren't deserters, they were American citizens too. And that annoyed the Americans, justifiably so. The other thing that the British were doing were blockading some of the ports. So the cry, free trade and sailors' rights, was one of the, uh, one of the slogans that the people used as a, uh, well, as a rallying cry to, to try and get things done. And there was a group of politicians called the Warhawks, mostly from the south and uh, western states. Henry Clay was one of the, uh, the leaders of that. And they finally decided the only way to resolve this was to actually declare war and go to war. 
So on June 18th, 1812, they declared war. Now some people thought this was a big mistake. We didn't really have much of an army at that time, and we really didn't have the funds for carrying on a large-scale war. But it went ahead anyway. The, uh, the land battles, from what I recall, didn't go too well. One of the plans they had was uh, they're going to attack Canada and make Canada part of America. And with an army of 10,000 men, you just can't do that kind of a land battle. Where they did make some very brilliant successes was in the naval situation. And Britain had a world-renowned navy, and they didn't think too much of anyone else's navy, especially the colonialists. And after Earth, they met a few of the ships like Old Ironsides, the USS Constitution, um, they began taking the American Navy a little more seriously. Well, anyway, that's basically how we do the feathers there. When you get to this point on the carving, I just kind of work all around it. And we can do the same thing, putting the feathers like along the neck, using exactly the same technique. Now these are a little smaller, so I'm going to make them just a, a little smaller here because the feathers on the neck of a bird, particularly the bald eagle, are finer than the wing feathers. Anyway, that's the general idea. Now for doing the finishing details on these feathers, you can take a V-gouge, gouge, and that's one we talked about last week. It's just sort of shaped like a little bit of a V. And you can go down and inscribe the shaft on the center. And while you have it in your hand, you can go and make a couple of feather breaks there. And that gives the texture and the illusion of the feathers. Ooh, one and what they planned to do was basically cut the United States at that time in half. And it's a very bold move, and it might have worked. The Lake George and uh, Lake Champlain, there have been battles fought over those waters since the days of the French and Indian Wars, because it was the only real waterway in which you could move large amounts of troops and cannon and whatever um, any distance, because everything else was, well, like the Adirondacks, it was all mountains and forest. And you just can't move cannons and troops through mountains and forests very well. Thomas McDonough was in charge of the American fleet and met the British at the part of Lake Champlain near uh, Plattsburgh, and it's called the Battle of Plattsburgh Bay, and had a decisive victory, at which point the expedition force that was coming down from the north said, hey, nuts with this. We're not going to have any supplies, and they went back. And that made a big difference in the outcome of this whole battle. So anyway, it was kind of an inconclusive battle, but makes good history. And also gave the United States sort of a sense of its own identity and national spirit. So hence, free trade and sailors' rights. The face is kind of a fun part on this eagle. And to detail it, we can take our macaroni gouge and carve around the nose here. And shape that. And this is where you can start putting your own personal interpretation in on your carving. I'm going to go to a V tool here because it's a little deeper to outline the beak. Now the beak is kind of tricky because it's sort of a narrow opening. And the best way to do that is to outline it with your tool and then narrow the back, shape the back so the beak is kind of thin, and just get in there with a pocket knife and carve that out. And that works pretty well. We can take our, uh, let's use our macaroni tool here and do his brow. So you see, when you get to doing the details on these, the V tools and the macaroni tools, anything that gives you a sharp angle is really the tool of choice. 
It's a very handy tool for doing details, even on little carvings. It's great because you can size lines, you can uh, carve feathers, you can carve all sorts of little details on any size carving. The problem with a V gouge is some people find them a little frustrating to sharpen. Some of the other gouges, if it's mostly sharp, it'll work. A V gouge won't cut unless it's perfectly sharp right down to the tip of that little V. Let me take a minute and show you how you can touch that up. Last time we talked a little bit about sharpening, particularly with a gouge, where we're doing a back and forth motion. A V gouge, because you're dealing with a flat side, takes a different type of a motion. Let's see, let me get a little bigger one that'll be easier to see. Ah, here we go. For sharpening a V gouge, you treat it like a chisel and just work it back and forth on the stone. And you want that about a 20 degree angle. And you just work that back and forth. On the other side, you work that back and forth and kind of do that evenly. Now, as with the other tools, eventually when you're using one of these uh, man-made India stones, it'll raise a little bit of a burr and just run your finger away from that cutting edge and you'll feel a little ridge of metal there. When you can feel that, that means that it's as sharp as the stone's gonna make it. But you're still only about halfway there. When you're done with the stone, just put a, a lid on it, put it away to keep the dust off. A cedar box, by the way, makes a very good cover for uh, a sharpening stone. It's impervious to the oil. To take the burr off, you can take a slipstone, and this is a, uh, a triangular slipstone that fits right inside the V, and just hold it about a 45 degree angle and gently draw it against that burr edge. What we're doing is actually putting on a micro bevel. That's fancy talk, it doesn't mean a whole lot, except we're putting on a little sharper angle there that's so slight it won't affect the cutting at all. Now sometimes when you're sharpening this, you'll get a bit of metal at the end here that forms sort of a hook. And when that happens, just work that on the sharpening stone until it disappears and then go and hone it and take the burr away. When that burr is gone, then we can polish it. And to do that, we'll take our strop. And this is one that I designed. It's got a little angled edge on here. And uh, you can buy these or you can make them. Uh, just cut your piece of wood and wrap a piece of leather around it. And then take and stroke that away from the cutting edge. And that will polish it to a razor sharp edge. And that's what you need when you're working the V tool. You can use the flat side for getting the flat sides of this and the center portion. I usually go a couple strokes this way, do a few on the center and do a few on that side, and just keep that up until it's razor sharp. The way to test for that is to take and make a practice cut in a piece of soft wood. And if it's sharp, it'll cut across the grain and give you a nice little curl. If it's dull at all, you'll get a lot of tearing with it. So that's one way to tell. Now on this carving here, when we're getting into the portion of the neck here in these hollow spots, the best way to get into there is to use a curved gouge like, oh, it's like a number nine or something. Something that's curved that'll fit in there. And you can just get in there and work away. And the tighter the curve, uh, the smaller the, the U-shape is that you want on it. And that's how we get in there to do the neck. And then help shape it. One other thing I wanted to mention here is um, we're talking about establishing our levels last time. And one of the things I mentioned was how it's nice to be able to use the same tool as much as you can. 
In this one we have where the neck comes down and then joins into the body. You have a little S turn there. You can take a gouge and do one side of that S shape and then just flip it over and use the other side of the gouge to do the other half. And that way you get an S shaped gouge with the same um, tool here. I'm going to set this in. Once our vertical cut is made, we can take our tool and go in there. And separate that. Sometimes if you're not going down too deep, you don't even need the milling. Just take your tool and rock it a little bit. And that's how we separate the um, body from the wings in this section. Then, all you need to do is just take and round that away. Then when you get around to where you want, just sketch in your feathers and draw your feathers. Um, the talons is something else that we worked on last week. And now that I have them shaped out, you can round off the angular shapes on them. Coming from the other way here, I can start to feel that wood split a little bit. The nice thing about doing a carving like this, there's so many different shapes and angles that you're working with, you really develop a good feeling and sensitivity for the grain of the wood. And then we can take our V-tool and carve out the line between the talons or the toes or whatever. And again, come around and draw the claws. Basically, we're just drawing with this tool. Now to round that, I could just go and round that straight away and then texture it. But I can also just do that in one step. And I'm using a small tool here uh, a small number eight gouge, which has a fair amount of curve to it. And by making little slight scooping motions, I can texture that so it looks like scales. And that also rounds it at the same time. These old wood carvers that were making these, boy, they, they had so many little techniques and tricks for doing it. Let me come around here and do it from the other side. That's the fun part about doing this. Once you get all the levels established, you can just go around and play and draw and have all sorts of fun with it. And then for doing the lines here, the easiest thing to do is just take and incise those with your V-tool. And this is where you want it sharp, so you want it to cut nice and even. A uh, dull tool is going to give you some frustration here. And if it's too dull, you have to push extra hard, and it's hard to, not to overcut your lines and go, which we don't want to do. The other thing I wanted to show you was how you can make these stars. One of the tricks for doing these stars, it's kind of fun, is we can take a V-tool. In this case, I'm going to use that, um, that one we just sharpened up. Where'd I put that? It's nice when you're doing these to lay your tools out in a sense of order, because you get a dozen tools out that you're working with, uh, and you don't have a pattern for it, you can waste a lot of time looking for your tools. For doing the star, I just kind of sketch it out. And then I make a cut in from each side towards the center. And in 
and that gives us a star. No pain, no strain. We can use the same thing for the lettering, but I'm going to do that later. One of the other problems that a lot of people have with a design like this is doing the scroll. And I'm going to take just a minute and show you how we can do that. Technically, the scroll isn't hard to do. It just takes a little, little bit of thinking because it's a different shape than what we're used to. I'm going to start out by incising down with a tool that, whose sweep matches that curve. And after you've incised down, then you cut, make a horizontal cut in. Sometimes you can also use a smaller tool for doing that. The scrolls, it's really not hard to carve, but you know, trying to take a block of wood and see a curved, twisted shape in it, uh, it takes a little practice and you sort of have to work on faith for a while. And just keep doing that until you get it down to the depth you want. Now, one tool that's very handy for using with the scrolls that isn't something that you use very often is called a back bent gouge. And this is a tool and it's shaped like a spoon gouge, except the cutting edge is reversed. And instead of cutting like this, it cuts like this. I know it sounds a little confusing, doesn't it? But where it's handy is you can come in and use that to clean down and undercut the side of a scroll. You can take this and you can actually cut way underneath here to give that a, a very thin edge, which in turn enhances the illusion of a thin folded piece of metal. Now the lettering is another thing that I want to show you. Remember how we did that uh, star just a minute ago? What you can do is take your V-gouge and you can take and make a line and just incise those. When you get to the serifs, just bring it down a little bit. angling that down, you create a deep cut, then take a knife or a skew chisel and just cut that clear and you can make the serifs. And then you can uh, just go through and lay out your lettering. Now, when you get that all done for painting it, what I did was I used acrylic paint, white and uh, red and blue. And I also used an acrylic gold on here. The lettering I painted in red enamel. And the nice thing about that is if it spills over on the acrylic, which is water-based, you can take a little turpentine and clean that off. And then I just coated the rest with the stain. And there's your War of 1812 Eagle. It takes a little time, but it's a really impressive piece when you have it finished. Next week, we're going to do a little bit something different with our animals. And we're going to be making this little red fox. And I'll be showing you how to texture the fur to make it look soft and fluffy. Hey, thanks for dropping by. I've had a great time talking with you. Until next time, I'm Rick Boots, wishing you happy carving. Rick Boots has written two books entitled Wood Carving Step by Step, Woodland Creatures and Santas. Rick demonstrates and describes through extensive illustrations and photographs how to carve a chipmunk, a river otter, a red fox, an alpine St. Nicholas, an Adirondack Santa and his bear, and a Swiss St. Nicholas. 
The two-book collection is available by calling 1-800-950-9648. The price is $29.90 plus shipping and handling. I think every teacher has to feel very deeply within his or her heart that these children are potential heroes, citizens of the future. That's what I love about public television. It seems to build on the innocence and idealism of children. We can imagine the future. We can construct it. We can create it. I feel that by remembering public television in an estate plan, we are contributing to the very values that we've nurtured right here now. We're really leaving this rich legacy to the children of the future. It's so true that one person, just one, can make such a difference. Broadcasting from Orange County, this is KOCE. Expand your mind. The best of PBS tonight during KOCE Summer Festival. At 8, you'll be tapping your toe to the Lawrence Welk Show's special, Shall We Dance? And at 9.10, enjoy a musical menagerie from eccentric British songwriters Flanders and Swan. We have then at 10.15, Michael Feldman asks his audience, what do you know? Enjoy radio host Feldman's quick wit as he recites his topical radio call-in quiz show. Uh, thanks to the global economy, uh, it is now uh, possible to uh, pay for a Mercedes and get a Chrysler. That's the latest development. <laughs> the Lawrence Welk Show, Flanders and Swan, and Michael Feldman's What Do You Know? The best of PBS tonight on KOCE. Earthshare. The world's leading environmental groups working together. Major funding for the Woodwright Shop is provided by State Farm Insurance, keeping our promise of protection to generation after generation. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Hello again. Welcome back to the Woodrush Shop. I'm Roy Underhill. 
back in the early 18th century in England, there was a problem. There were too many visitors to Windsor Castle. Now, where were they going to have all these people sit down? Well, they started making chairs based on wooden planks with legs just stuck in the bottom. And that became the Windsor chair. Over in America now, we started making variants on the Windsor chair that just became an explosion all throughout the 18th century. And this is the beginnings of what's called a comb-back Windsor chair. Because of this comb-like arrangement with the spindles in the back, we're going to be making one. Uh, this time we get together, we're going to make all the parts for it. We're going to shape out all the parts. Next time we get together, we'll assemble it. Two different jobs, making all the parts and then assembling them next time. So let's look at the parts now. Here we've got uh, the seat, of course. It's the basic uh, element of a Windsor chair, this beautifully sculpted out pine seat here. Then, of course, the legs are all just pierced through that, and there'll be uh, additionally stretchers through here. I haven't done those yet. We'll be putting those in next time. We just turn legs, and then these are connected into the seat. Then we have uh, seat posts. There are two seat posts on it. They support the arm rail which comes around here now this will have an, an additional hand put onto it to make it wide but we'll have to bend this next time this will have a hand glued and pegged on there on top of that post and then these spindles these are thin hickory shaved spindles here that form this comb and then we have the crest rail and it also is bent just like our arm rail all right so we've got to make all of these pieces that's what we're going to do this time let's start with the seat plank now traditionally in england these are done in elm sawn out of elm i'm going to work with pine pine and poplar and all kind of things we had some big pines go down here's a pine plank 21 inches by 16 and a half inches and i'm going to start with it you saw it out or you can split it out if you've got uh, some really straight grain stuff and then just start shaving it down. I've got a little kind of a curved spoke shave I'm gonna use and shave down across the grain to smooth off the saw marks and get a nice level looking board. You can also do that with, let me see, I've got a, whoa, a jack plane back here. I mean, a little scrub plane. And again, working across the grain in the green wood, you can smooth this out real nice and then set it aside if you want. You can set these aside for 20 years. I have some elm that I put aside 20 years ago. It's still uh, down to my last piece, which is a little bit small. All right, again, 21 by 16 and a half. Smooth it out. Then start laying out for this shape. Uh, we're going to lay out kind of an oval or a D shape for a comb back Windsor. I've done it on the this side here, so you can get a sense of how it's done. Uh, rectangular to start. Then I'm going to set this nine inches. These dividers are set at nine inches from here to here. Swing that out, all right, make an arc of nine inches here. We'll go flat across and then nine inches here to here, oh, here to here. So I've got another arc here to make this D shape. This would be the back of the seat here. So it comes around nine inch corners and then uh, say five or six inch radius on the front. Now, you got to cut these corners off. How are you going to do that? I'm going to do it with a hatchet, and I've got one that I've already chopped with a hatchet. And while this stuff is still green, it's real easy to work with a hatchet. After it dries, you might have to go to a saw. Right. So here's a corner now, and you can see that's that 9-inch radius around the corner here. And I'm just going to take it off with this side hatchet. So here we go. And right on down, following the grain. It's easier to do, of course, when you're more along the grain like I am right now as we turn it'll get a little bit harder as we go around that's all right there we go you cut this out of course with a bow saw in the dryer wood there we go. or make a single saw cut with a hand saw with a uh, wide bladed hand saw and then uh, trim it down with a chisel or what have you. Point is you shape the outline of your Windsor chair seat blank. This is about an inch and uh, three quarters thick to up to two inches thick here. Now they're gonna warp when you know when you cut them out they're gonna warp before they dry the rings will tend to flatten out. Getting this 
intense. See, it's getting tougher to cut as we go around the corner there. And we're cutting more across the grain. It can split off bad, too, here. So let's see if I can trim from front and back. Now, see, if we were doing a writing arm, Windsor, we'd want to leave that on, wouldn't we? All right, enough of that. Trim right on down to the line. You get the idea. Enough of that. <laughs> All right. So we've got a uh, piece trimmed down, and it's going to warp. So a little bit of extra thickness will allow you to plane that uh, extra warping out. Now, start with the hollowing that makes this uh, comfortable. I'll just take a pair of dividers now with a pencil in them, and set it for what? Oh, three inches, say. Uh, two, three inches here. Depends on the chair you're making, and then run it around from the outside in. All right, that's before you start rounding the perimeter. And that'll give you a delineation for the hollowing that you're going to do. Okay. So that's giving me a mark within which I will hollow. All right, now say on the pattern, you can do these from pictures and books, but believe me, the easiest way is if you have a Windsor chair that you, a chair that you like that you want to copy that's the easiest way to do it so i've delineated a spot and we're going to start hollowing within that i'm going to set this on the floor now and start with an ads but the easiest way to do it is to find a chair that you like and then copy that uh because believe me the guys who made windsors i didn't just start off and say oh i'm going to make one and name one before uh, they have one right there that they were going to copy from the shop that they worked in as an apprentice or uh they went in the business, somebody might even bring them one and say, make me one like this. I need a half dozen or a dozen more in this form. I'm using a curved ads now to hollow and just work it all around going down. Well, depending upon the thickness of your seat, if it's too thin, you can't go down an inch, but really you're hollowing down about an inch all the way around working from the outside in and again as I like working across the grain. All right. So that's scooping well, scooping well. All right, but I'm going to show you another technique here now. Instead of using the ads which can be tough to get a hold of, you can also do this with a mallet and a chisel, a gouge actually here. This is just a long curved gouge. I'll take a mallet and you can do it just almost as fast uh, using this arrangement. All right, so scoop it out roughly. See, I'm going right back up to the line. Right, scoop along. Along the back, and right here. So this is for your D-shaped home back Windsor seat. You see how easy to control it is using this gouge with the bevel on the outside, digging down and scooping out. All right, now, from that point, what do you do? We've got more smoothing to do. Uh, let's see, I know I'm going to do the inside. Uh, how would you smooth this now? You've roughly done it. You can still just come back with the gouge again and really do it by hand particularly if you're working in green wood, you can very easily hand carve that just like that, all right? And sweep out those ridges in between because you're not moving a lot of wood. But there's also a lot of devices you can use. Here is a radius bottom uh, spoke shave. You can see it has the blade on a convex surface there. Uh, an unusual kind of spoke shave. And this will work, again, with the grain, across the grain, to start smoothing out all that roughness that's left by the initial hollowing. All right. All right, now that's starting to get smooth in there. Let me move to another plank, though, that's farther along. This is one that's in dry wood, and it, in fact, is made a different way. This is a piece that is glued up now. This is also glued up from two-by plank. You can see how smooth and nice that is down there. 
It's because I've been going over it with this spoke shave with the grain, and you can hear a difference in the tone. Listen to the way that works in dry wood. Oh, hold it there. Need a peg down there in my bench top. You notice how it starts to get rough when I get to the middle because I'm coming back up. All right, now that works good not only for that long grain, but also works coming around these corners here, getting in like this. Here, see if I can, uh, let's try getting in right here. All right, to get up inside of that edge to make a nice smooth, <laughs> make a nice smooth, he said, a smooth transition. Uh, there we go. All right. Between the flat area and the hollowed area. There we go. All right, there's your bench. And there's your seat starting to hollow out there. All right, so you get that sculpted out. This would be the front of it here. I just set that aside now because we're gonna go on to the other parts. All right, what are our split parts? They are, of course, the spindles, the, uh, the rails, the, both the arm rail and the crest rail, and the legs and stretchers, which we have to put in. And we're gonna do them out of hickory now. And let's do a leg first, because it's the simplest. About 18 inches long, and I've got a piece of hickory. And here's a fro. And I've split this down. Now I'm going to do is get down to about two inches rectangular. And then we're going to shave it, ready to go into the lathe. And see, I've got the fro there. Just tap it in and get it started. You can see the difference between the heartwood and the sapwood in hickory. All right, bust that in now. That starts as a wedge. Now I'll put my knee against it, pull back on the handle. There. Tap it down a little more. And we're just going to split off this side piece. All right, and that's all we have to do with this one. All right. There's that. All right, now that's ready to go. We just take that over there. I could chop that a little more, but I'm not going to worry about it. We'll do that on the shaving horse. A spindle. Now, here's a good piece for a spindle. All sapwood now. There's nothing really wrong with the heartwood. But set the fro in. Now, this is going to be one of those thin spindles. Here's where you really want to split it out to get the thickness and get the strength in the wood there. And I always start in the middle and try and go from the middle all the way down the middle. And there you are. There's a nice piece for a spindle. And we'll shave these. So that's done. Now, here's a fun one. This is going to be for the arm rail and this is four feet long in hickory and you need a real knot free piece now if you get hickory that uh, has rings that are too tight it'll just snap when you bend it you want wide growth rings in hickory believe it or not and so this piece four feet long i'm busting off the heartwood now and this is probably all we'll have to do and if it starts to get you see, if that split started to run towards me into the white area, which is what I want, I would turn around and bend the dark area more. And that's how you direct a split with a fro. You bend more on the thicker side. And there you are, all right? That's a piece ready. Still way too thick. I'm going to put it over here because I've got another piece that's a little thinner. We need to split that again. And then finally, for the crest rail, look here. This is one I'm going to split just the heart off in a big wide piece and it's pretty much the same split as we did before but here we're going to split it again and make a bit of plank for the crest rail so here's a flat board for the crest rail all right just like that you see there's a thin piece we'll split that again down there and take off the outside but that's fine that's enough so split out all these pieces while the wood is green they'll split much much easier and then you come over here to the shaving horse. And you can start shaving. Here's that piece. A shaving horse is just a foot operated vice. Allows you to hold the work with your foot while you use a draw knife to shave it down. There, so here, here's that piece for the arm rail. And I'm gonna bring that down to about an inch square because we're gonna bend this green. All right, so start that in. 
and try and take long strokes with the draw knife. Now, you can steam bend this, too. But I think if you've got green hickory, it'll bend without steaming just fine. Now, here down the heart. All right. And then turn it. So we just keep turning it and bring it down to a rectangle. I've got a piece here that's a finished piece. That's what we want to get down to. All right. Something about this thin, about an inch cube. And that's going to be pretty easy to bend. But we've split it out so it's a long, straight, even grained piece of wood there. And that's going to bend for our arm rail. All right. Crest rail. Here's our crest rail. This is another flat piece that we split out. Let's see. This is how it would start and shave it down. But the problem here is you got a lot of flat grain, and with a draw knife, the uh, knife tends to dig into the flat grain. It'll get under a growth ring and start to dig in and tear. So that's where going to a tool like this, a spoke shave, a draw knife might dig in, a spoke shave like this one is more like a plane, and it won't dig in, because only a little bit of the blade is exposed, and you can work it like this. Isn't that pretty? And you get down to a plank that we're going to bend in just a second to make the crest rail. But again, you do this while it's green, and while the wood is green, it's soft and easy to bend, but it's also a little tougher. It doesn't have that integrity, and it tends to tear. So be careful and go back on the grain when you have to. All right, that's a piece ready to blend. Bend. <laughs> bend. And then we'll blend it into the chair. All right, now bending. Got to make that long rail that fits around so that we come uh, out with a piece kind of like this here. See this, this rail? Uh, this is about an inch cube. And we bend it, and it'll hold that shape after about a week. Now, here's what we make to bend it on. Make a uh, template, a, a frame or something that's about uh, undersized from the seat that you're going to do, because you want your finished arm to be about under <laughs> to be uh, the total when you bend the arm around it. I want that to be equal to the seat. Now, I've taken a clamp here and put it on this end. All right, put enough protruding over there. And I'm going to just bend down. And because this is green hickory and the cells of the wood are still swollen with water, should be able to bend it all the way around. Now, normally, you'd have to steam wood in order to do this here. So that goes all the way around. And I try and keep it flat against that backside so you can see I can put more clamps on if I need to. All right, now, do I have a clamp within reach is the question. <laughs> this will go explode across the room. Here's another clamp so I can hold it down and then screw this clamp on. And I should have that ready bent. All right, so that's bent around. I can hammer, actually, hammer that in and push that down. And it'll hold that shape in about a week. You'll be able to take that out, saw it in half, and you'll have two arm rails. All right. Now the crest rail. A little bit tough to do that with the crest rail because it's shorter and it doesn't have enough leverage. So we've got another method here for the crest rail. Where'd I put the crest rail? Uh, it's got to be. Here it is. It's a snake I wouldn't have been looking for, would I? I've got two bricks here, and I use bricks because they grip the wood real well. And you see why you wouldn't want to slip into it, because we're going to use the clamp here. I put this uh, C clamp in the middle between that stretcher. I've got to pull it up to get it to fit on there. There it goes. Okay. Now, be able to use the C-clamp and just really screw that down. And because we've got these two fulcrum points on either side, we will be able to bend the crest rail pretty easily, just using the pressure of the screw between those two points. Now, you can put forms in here and wedges to get just the shape you want. And if this snaps, you may have a bad hickory tree. It happens all the time. All right. Oh, oh, what's snapping? A little bit giving with the grain. That's all right. This is going to be fine. In fact, let me see. Here's what it's going to look like 
when we go back at it next week, it'll be a nice crest rail, and we'll be able to uh, do all this business, including carving those volutes on the end. But this is how it begins. It's got to just bend in a frame like this, and you can see we'd want to put a block of wood to make a more even bend. All right, so there we go. Those are our bendy pieces now. I'm going to go back over to the chair for a second. I'll show you our next step real quick. We're just going to shave down some more now. We've got our legs to go. All right, we've still got spindles to turn. And we've got to do these spindles here. And they have different diameters, too. Now, we're going to do this all with shaving. And what I've done is taken an auger and bored through on this little block of wood the diameters of the greatest point here, right here. That's this big hole. All right, and then the bottom, that's the hole right here. And then the diameter at this point here, that's right there. So use the same augers that I'm going to use for these three points, the bottom, the middle, and where it goes through the rail. We'll take that over to the shaving horse. Oh, but first, <laughs> we need to take a leg with us, because we're going to copy that. Uh, and again, like I say, you want to copy these either from a photograph or copy them from uh, one that you have around. That's probably the way most all of the old Windsor chair makers work. They certainly had one in, another one in the shop to work with. Here's one of those spindles shaved down a bit. And, you know, you can use the draw knife just fine. You use the draw knife just fine to shave, all right? But you can see the draw knife will kind of dig in. It has just one point of contact. It's not smoothing at level like a plane. So using longer uh, spoke shaves, bottomed spoke shaves like this will help you out. All right. That helps a lot because this has a longer bed on it. But here's a tool with a much longer bed, and this really helps straighten out that split grain. This is a Wheelwright's Jarvis. All right, it's a two-handed tool, but it's more of a scraper. The angle of attack of the iron is much sharper, and you could make one of these. I happen to, was lucky to find this old one. That long bed really holds it steady while it smooths out the spindles. All right, so we've got to make all these spindles. Uh, we put our stuff in to bend for us, and that's doing. We're smoothing here. You see how that levels it out. I've got another trick you can use. If you have a hollow plane, now this little plane here is a hollow. It's a molding plane, basically, and you can see the radius on the bottom of it. It's concave like that, and there's the iron. You can clamp it in the vise like that in your shaving horse, hold it like that, and just pull back. And you can see how that will help to even up those spindles just fine, so they look like they're turned. All right, they're not. These are actually shaved. You could turn them, but boy, they whip around a heck of a lot. So all these little tricks to make them uh, even is real important. All right. Now, I've been using lots of gadgets, but still, let me show you one last thing. The uh, versatility of the draw knife. The draw knife, and here I've got one you can see a little closer, can go deep. It can go shallow. Look at the wonderful control you have with this tool here. Now, here it is. It can tilt. You can see as you have a blade's eye view, and you can cut shallow little curls like that. You can cut deep, all right? Or you can just cut the finest little shavings that you want there. Ding, ding, ding. All right, so that is the draw knife and the most versatile tool of all. Well, what we're going to do next time we get together is we're going to take our roughed out piece like this, and we're going to start turning. And we will see how to turn uh, the spindles like this, the uh, not the spindles, I keep going the spindles, these are the legs. We'll uh, see how to bore the tapered holes to insert them into the plank. We'll put through the stretchers here, and then bore in the uh, arm posts, the arm, the posts that are turned up here that hold the arm rails. We'll glue on the hands, we'll have those ready to go, and we'll start assembling the spindles uh, all into the crest rail, and that will start our assembly of our Windsor chair when we get together again next time. So thanks for joining me here. I'll see you then. This has been Roy Underhill here in the Woodwright shop. <laughs> so long. The Woodwright's Apprentice, a project book based on this series, is available in bookstores and libraries or by calling the toll-free number on your screen. The price is $17.95 plus shipping and handling. Please have your credit card ready.
Major funding for the Woodwright Shop is provided by... State Farm Insurance, keeping our promise of protection to generation after generation. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. This is PBS. This Woodwright Shop episode is available on video cassette for $19.95, plus shipping and handling. Call 1-888-774-1144. Please have your credit card ready and specify episode number 1608. Local presentation of the preceding woodworking program has been made possible in part by Mike's Wood and Metal Tools, Southern California's full-time tool show, featuring live demonstrations of Delta, Smithy, Super Shop, and the new Jessam Router Slide. You can make almost anything with tools from Mike's. And by KOCE members like you. Broadcasting from Orange County, this is KOCE. Expand your mind. Relive the days of World War II with Danger UXB. Tales of courageous men who risked their lives disarming bombs that rained on England. Sunday at 8 on KOCE. When Helmut and Erika Simon went hiking in the Austrian Alps, they had no idea they would make the most important discovery in modern archaeology. They had discovered the oldest and most perfectly preserved human body ever recovered. A man almost as old as the pyramids. This spectacular discovery would hold thousands of clues to the times in which he lived. Now nature has revealed this body to a society with the technology to unlock the secrets of the ice man. Monday on KOCE, adventures near and far. At 8, we hit the road with Antiques Roadshow. We're heading to the city of brotherly love, Philadelphia. Here, experts look at silver and jewelry, fine paintings and furniture, and objects from the great Pennsylvania German tradition. Then at 9, World of National Geographic. In 1960, Jane Goodall came to the African forest to study the elusive wild chimpanzee. She was destined to make scientific history documenting the complex animals most like mankind. Today, her work, through others, lives on. An awesome portrait of life among the wild chimpanzees. Finally at 10, it's time to be making tracks. Explore the wonders of travel by train as a pair of rails take you on a pathway of discovery across the European continent. Antiques Roadshow, National Geographic, and Making Tracks, a night of fascinating adventures, Monday on KOCE. The new Yankee Workshop on KOCE is made possible by the Woodworkers Club at the 55 Freeway and McFadden in Orange County, providing a fully equipped do-it-yourself woodworking shop with professional instructors and hands-on classes. The Woodworkers Club, helping people discover the world of woodworking. And by KOCE members like you. Hi, I'm Norm Abram. Welcome to the New Yankee Workshop. Now, if I was to tell you that you could take crummy old white pine planks like these and turn them into a table like this, would you consider building this project? Well, I hope so, because I got all the details next, right here in the New Yankee Workshop. The New Yankee Workshop features the craftsmanship of Norm Abram and is made possible by... Funding is made possible by the Thompson's Company. Makers of Thompsonized wood, a new generation of wood that's waterproofed to the core to help prevent warping and splitting. Thompsonized wood, built to last beautifully. Delta Woodworking Machinery. A full line of precision shop tools available at woodworking dealers, hardware stores, and home centers. Delta, building on tradition. Porter Cable Professional Power Tools. Made in America since 1906 and available through woodworking dealers, hardware stores, and home centers everywhere. 
Porter Cable, the woodworker's choice. What you're looking at is a barn that was built in 1860. And it's the oldest structure here at the Mayakamas Vineyard. It needs a new roof, the sills are rotted, the siding is falling off. But if it was mine, I would leave it alone. It's the prized possession of Bob and Noni Trevers who make the wine here. They also collect beautiful pine antiques. And I wanted to show you this tape. It's over 10 feet long. And the top is made from recycled planks. There's been no effort to fix all the defects. Some of the nails still show. Some of the bigger holes have been filled in, but some of the flaws have been just left alone. Look at the end of the table. The planks are joined together with a spline, and it shows through. It just adds some nice character. But what I really like about this table are the proportions. It's just the right height. There's plenty of room for my legs to fit under the rail, and it'll easily sit 10 of my thirstiest friends. We're going to have to build one of these back at the New Yankee Workshop. Another one. One of those nasty cut nails. Well, I got to tell you, finding the antique lumber and then removing all the bits of iron takes longer than actually doing the woodworking project itself. Now, when I went up to my antique wood supplier, I asked him for some pine planks, and this is what he showed me. I said, you've got to be joking. This will never turn into anything that looks decent. He said, be patient, clean it up, you'll be surprised. And look at the result. Here's our table, pretty much like the one you saw in the Napa Valley, the same dimensions. The top of the table I made up of three white pine planks. They did clean up beautifully, and I left the little nail holes behind and any other small defects to add some character to the piece. The base of the table is made from hard pine, the legs and the rails that join the legs together. Now, the hard pine came from some old beams that usually come out of barns or old warehouses. And look at this wood. Look at how tight the growth rings are to one another. This was a very slow growing tree. And if you take the time to cut stock out of beams like this, the result is lumber that is just absolutely beautiful. Very straight grain and very close together. A nice stable piece of wood. And even though it's over 100 years old, you can still smell the sap. Now, if you'd like to build the long table, a measured drawing is available with the materials list, and you'll hear more about that before the program ends. Now, I want to get started today by cutting the best 10-foot section out of each plank. But before we use any power tools, I want to take a moment to talk about shop safety. Be sure to read, understand, and follow all the safety rules that come with your power tools. Knowing how to use your power tools properly will greatly reduce the risk of personal injury. And remember this, there is no more important safety rule than to wear these safety glasses. Oh, that's good. Now, I still have a fair amount of nail removal to do in these planks, but let's go on to the hard pine. Now, here's a chunk of beam that I've actually removed all the nails from, and the objective is to turn it into a couple blanks for the legs. I'm going to use my resaw, which is just a large band saw with a very wide blade, coarse teeth with carbide tips. The first pass is just to take off a bit of the skin. Well, now I want to trim off a little bit along this edge, which is the sapwood, and a little along this edge, which is actually the heartwood, leaving the tightest grain section for my blank.
What I've just done is made a few passes through the joiner to get one face of the blank flat. That's the first step in squaring up the blank. If I place the jointed edge against the fence and run the adjacent side through, I'll have one square corner. Now I'll turn to the surface planer. I'll place the jointed edge on the table, and as the piece passes through the planer, both the top and bottom edge will become parallel. For the last few minutes, I've been taking the blank and rounding it over, simply using my gouge. Now, the next thing I want to do is some layout. I have a gauge stick here, which actually duplicates the first leg that I turned. And there are critical intersections that I want to mark. Once I get them marked, I'll use my parting tool and some calipers to check the diameter. Well, a few minutes with some 150 grit sandpaper, doing the final sanding to smooth out all of the turning. After this, two more legs to go. The rails of the table are connected to the legs with a mortise and tenon joint. I'm starting to form the mortises in the legs here by using a one inch flat bottom bit called a Forstner bit set to cut to a depth of an inch and a half. Now I could finish up each mortise with a good sharp chisel, but since there are so many, I made a template out of quarter inch plywood with a hole in it that's a little bit larger than the finished mortise. To complete the mortise, I'm gonna use my router, which is equipped with a collar and a straight cutting bit. The collar will ride on the inside of the cutout and the bit will do the rest of the work. I milled the rails for the table from another length of hard pine beam using the same procedures that I used to make the blanks for the legs. Now on each end I have to cut a tenon and this lumber is relatively heavy and it's a very long piece. So it would be difficult at the table saw using just the miter gauge to guide it through. So here I'm going to keep the stock stationary and use my radial arm saw, which is set up with a stacked dado head cutter. And I've put a stop block up against the fence to limit the length of the tenon. If I make passes from each side, I'll have a centered tenon one inch thick. I've just made an adjustment to the radial arm, raising the blade so that I can complete the cut at the bottom of the tenon. That's good right there. And now one final adjustment and a test to cut the top of the tenon.
Okay, that's good. Three quarters of an inch. Here I'm starting to form an open mortise. And that'll receive a cross piece at the center of the table. Now, I will leave the back corner of the mortise round, but I'm going to clean up this open side. Now, one more finishing touch to the tenons. A little saw cut at the shoulder, and while I have the sharp chisel out, I'm just going to round off each corner so that it'll properly fit into that mortise I made in each leg. And finally, I'm just going to chamfer the bottom edge of each rail. It's my block plane, because that's where your legs are going to slide under the table. And after I finish that, I'll sand each piece smooth. And first thing tomorrow morning, we'll assemble the base. Oh, good morning. Come on over here to the drill press, and I'll show you what I got started doing this morning. In order to attach the top to the base, I'm going to need some holes for some screws. So I've drilled at several locations on each rail. First, a 3 8 inch diameter counter bore, 3 quarters of an inch deep for the head of the screw. Then I drilled a through hole, 3 16 of an inch in diameter all the way through. And the final and most important hole is this one, a 1 inch diameter counter bore an inch deep. And what that'll allow is the screw to move back and forth as the top expands and contracts. Well, before we can assemble the table, there's one more piece I have to make, and I want to show it to you over here on the prototype. At the center of the table, there's one cross rail. It adds support to the top, and it gives me a place to attach the top right at the center. Here's the piece of stock that I'm using, and I've already rabbited out each end so that it'll fit into the mortise that I made in the long rails yesterday. The last thing that I have to do is round over the corners so that it'll fit in that mortise properly. And to do that, I'm going to use my sanding center. That's going to be fine. Now, we'll begin the assembly of the table by building the two short ends. I'm just applying glue to both the mortise and the tenon, and we'll slip them together and clamp them in place. Now, we'll start the main assembly by installing the center rail first. And to secure it, along with the glue, a couple of screws. Now let's see how this goes together. Okay. okay. Now we'll put a clamp on it, and this is where the center brace comes in handy. Since this base is almost nine feet long, I can use shorter clamps up against the center brace. Now this other clamp will help to pull the bottom of the mortise tight on the leg. This over and under technique works pretty well. Well, now for the top. 
I'm taking each one of the planks and ripping a little bit off each edge. I want to get the maximum amount that I can out of each piece. Now, it did take some time to remove the nails, about two and a half hours. Let me show you the pile that I ended up with. Quite a few, but well worth taking the time to remove them because only one will ruin a saw blade. Well, I hate to do this, but a 16 and a half inch plank just will not go through a 12 inch planer. So what I'm gonna have to do is rip this in half. And after I surface planed it, when I assemble the top, I'll bring the same two edges back together. Maybe you won't even see the joint. Well, for the last few minutes, I've been working on the edges of all the planks for the top. I'm making them square and straight using my handheld power plane. Now, it's a little difficult to use the joiner with boards this long if you're working alone. It takes a little longer with the power plane, but it does a fine job. Now, you'll notice that I'm using a double row of biscuits every one foot on center. All right, with glue on all the surfaces, let's see if we can get these pieces to go together. <clears throat> this is when I wish I had a few extra hands around. That's great. Now at each intersection of a rail and a leg, I'm putting in this half inch peg. And that will not only add some strength to the joint, but it's a nice decorative touch. Well, that cuts it to length. Now I'll just belt sand the edges. Well, now it's just a matter of sanding the whole top smooth with my random orbit sander. I'm starting out with 100 grit, and then I'll go to 120, because this pine is so soft. Now, some 3 and 3 quarter inch screws in the holes that I pre-drilled earlier will secure the top. Now, inevitably, you will find some defects in the top that you don't want to just let go, like this one right here. I don't want anyone to get any splinters. So what we're going to do is make a Dutchman or fill it in. Now, in the old days, you could chisel it all out and make a piece to fit. Today, I use a template, which I made out of hardboard, sort of a rectangular shape. It's not perfectly square, it's a little irregular. Put some double stick tape on it so that when I set it on the table top, it'll just stick in position. Now to plow out the bad material, I'm gonna use my router, which is equipped with a special collar and a little spiral bit. All right, with that all cleaned out, I can just remove the template 
and place it on a piece of scrap stock that's the same material I used to make the top. Then I remove the brass bushing from the collar, and that'll allow me to cut a patch that'll fit the mortise perfectly. Now to remove the patch, I first remove the template, and then I'll rip the board to get the patch out. Now to complete the removal of the patch, I'm just gonna use my mat knife to just cut through the last bit of material. Let's see how that's going to fit. All right, well now, because the corners of the mortise are just a little bit round, I'm going to take a piece of sandpaper and round each corner of the patch. I'll just sand it flush. Well, maybe one more patch and a little bit of final sanding, and this table will be ready for some finish. Now, to protect the wood of our long table, it's really a two-step process on the heart pine turnings and the rails of the table, as well as the underside of the top and the top itself, I put several coats of tongue oil and let those dry thoroughly. But then there's a second step, which is actually to give it a little bit of luster. I applied a paste wax, just simply laid it on the top of the table, and now I'm just gonna buff it with my buffer. Now, we certainly expect that over the years, because this is such a soft wood on the tabletop, that it will receive a lot of abuse, nicks and dings. But that's what we want, and we expect that as it ages, it'll start to look more beautiful. Well, that turned out great. Now I think it's time to call 10 or 12 of my closest friends and invite them over for a banquet. Come to think of it, Maybe I better check with the wife first. Now, next time, I'm going to build this six-draw double dresser, and I'll be using some more of that antique pine. But it's expensive, so I'll have to use it effectively. I'll show you how next time, right here in the New Yankee Workshop. The New Yankee Workshop is made possible by the Thompson Minwax Company, makers of Minwax. With a complete family of stains, protective finishes, and wood care products, Minwax helps turn a house into a home. Minwax makes and keeps wood beautiful. Delta Woodworking Machinery. A full line of precision shop tools available at woodworking dealers, hardware stores, and home centers. Delta, building on tradition. Porter Cable Professional Power Tools. Made in America since 1906 and available through woodworking dealers, hardware stores, and home centers everywhere. Porter Cable, the woodworker's choice. Production of WGBH, Boston. To order a measured drawing of the long table, please send $10 to the New Yankee Workshop, Box 9345, South Burlington, Vermont.
This is PBS. The new Yankee Workshop projects are now available on home video. To order your copy of the project you've just seen, you may call 1-800-892-0110. Please have your credit card ready. Each home video includes a measured drawing and a materials list with all the dimensions you will need to build your project. The price for this home video is $24.95 plus shipping and handling. The new Yankee Workshop on KOCE is made possible by the Woodworkers Club at the 55 Freeway and McFadden in Orange County, providing a fully equipped do-it-yourself woodworking shop with professional instructors and hands-on classes. The Woodworkers Club, helping people discover the world of woodworking. And by KOCE members like you. Broadcasting from Orange County, this is KOCE. Expand your mind. I'm as common as an old shoe. When you lived your small town day, and you go home and you have your supper, you turn on your TV, and the world's right there. Public television gave me a way of understanding things that I had never approached before. You can get anything in the world by just sitting back in your lazy boy chair. So now we have an opportunity of ensuring that the youth of today go into tomorrow with a gift from us. And when the great programmer upstairs calls you home, you can give a small part. You can make things a little bit better because of you being here. The best of PBS tonight during KOCE Summer Festival. At eight, you'll be tapping your toe to the Lawrence Welk Show's special, Shall We Dance? And at 9.10, enjoy a musical menagerie from eccentric British songwriters, Flanders and Swan. We have been inextricably entwined. We didn't have to be ever after in the honeysuckle of the vine we then at 10.15, Michael Feldman asks his audience, what do you know? Enjoy radio host Feldman's quick wit as he recites his topical radio call-in quiz show. Uh, thanks to the global economy, uh, it is now uh, possible to uh, pay for a Mercedes and get a Chrysler. That's the latest element. <laughs> the Lawrence Welk Show, Flanders and Swan, and Michael Feldman's What Do You Know? The best of PBS tonight on KOCE. Don't sit at home and just laugh with us. Come to the garage and experience At Home on the Range, live and in person. Tickets are free, and you can get them by calling our hotline at 714-851-3922 or visiting our website at www.hotrange.com. There are two shows per night at 6.30 and 8.30 p.m. Join us in the back bay of Newport Beach. Hey, Norm. Nice looking project. Thanks, Steve. What is it? It's a tiger maple washstand, and I found the original when we were doing our This Old House project down in Savannah. Ah, oh, Savannah. What a great town. You know, we should go back down there and pay a visit to Mills and Marianne, our homeowners, see how they're doing. We'll do that. We've got pins all over the country here. Two in Florida. Where I got one in Tampa, St. Petersburg for that project. And then Miami, where we did that Mediterranean Revival style house. It was damaged by Hurricane Andrew. Right. Louisiana? That's right, that's where we did that double shotgun. Yeah, we had a lot of oysters and crawfish in that project, too. <laughs> yeah. And a lot of dust when we were doing that job. <laughs> that's true. Arizona? One for Phoenix. And then one in Santa Fe, New Mexico, that adobe we did out there. Yeah. A couple in my home state of California. One down in Santa Barbara. And then one up in Napa. Boy, remember all the rain we had that winter? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then one year you made me paddle all the way to Honolulu, Hawaii. And you're a better man for it, too. <laughs> right. But wasn't that a stunning sight overlooking uh, Diamond Head there? It was great. 
Then you've got one out in the middle of the ocean. What's yeah, that the map's about? not quite big enough. That represents our project over in London, England. Oh, of course. The Georgian-style townhouse near Notting Hill Gate. Right. And, of course, right in the Boston area, 17 years' worth of old houses. Including last year's in Salem, which reminds me, we should go back and see how the Guineas are doing, too. Yeah. Now, here's a pin for this year. Where are we going? How about right here, 30 miles off the coast of Massachusetts, where I get started as a general contractor. Nantucket Island? Nantucket. We're going to Nantucket? We're going to Nantucket. All right. Funding for this old house is provided by State Farm Insurance, keeping our promise of protection to generation after generation. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Glidden Paint. For over 120 years, Glidden has been bringing American homes to life. Glidden, bringing your home to life. And by. When it comes to tough hand tools, we're making a name for ourselves. Because they're made with a full lifetime warranty. That's Ace, the name to know for hand tools. So this is the way to get there, huh? The legendary Nantucket steamship. That's right. This is the only way to go to Nantucket, especially for your first visit. How come? I mean, you can fly from Hyannis in 10 minutes. Well, that's true. We're going to be on the boat for about 2 hours and 15 minutes, but you're going to get the true experience, you know? You're going to get out there the way the ancient mariners did, by sea. Well, it's a nice day today. Sun shining, nice and smooth. Going to have a nice ride. What about in the winter when the wind howls? Well, I've been on this boat in the winter, and it can get pretty rough. In fact, sometimes the wind will shut the boat down. Yeah. Now, we do have fog sometimes, but the boat seems to make it through that without much problem. Hmm. Well, another thing that's legendary is the coffee. Let me buy you a cup. OK. All right, my favorite part of the ship, the freight deck. Yeah, they got bicycles down here, passenger cars, pickup trucks, even trail trucks. Because, you know, everything that's needed on the island, every French fry, every bed sheet, every two by four has to go over there on a boat like this. So what does it cost? Well, to come on as a passenger with your one piece of luggage, $10 each way. Yeah. And if you bring your bicycle, it'll cost you another five. You don't need a reservation. What about a pickup truck? Now, for this, it's going to cost you $100 each way. And you better make a reservation four to six months ahead of time. Come on. You can't just drive up? No way. You could wait for standby, but you might be there a week or so. Is that right? Yeah. So I guess the lesson is leave your car at home. Yeah. Well, we should start seeing it pretty soon, Norm. Yeah, well, often the first thing that you'll see will be off this port side, and it'll be a lighthouse out on the end of Great Point where there's great fishing. Oh, yeah? We'll yeah. check that one out. We will. Now, the island sort of curves around to the south. It's about three miles wide in the middle, and it's about 14 miles end to end. All sand? All sand. We're going to come in mid-island on the north side, right into Nantucket Town. Great. Hey, that's a sweet-looking lighthouse. What do they call that one? Well, that's the Brant Point Lighthouse, guarding Nantucket Harbor. Oh, yeah. Now, aren't you supposed to toss a penny in the water when you go around the point? Oh, but not now. You do that when you leave. That way, you'll be sure to come back. Glad I got that one right. <laughs> well, you're right, Norm. That's the only way to get here the first time. That's right. Wow. What atmosphere. <laughs> Isn't it great? So, uh, what's the plan? Well, I thought I'd take you on a sentimental visit. Oh, yeah? Yeah. To my first big general contracting job. Now, it's been 20 years, but I know it's around here somewhere. First one, huh? Now, Steve, when I did this job, my partner, Jim Cleary, and I needed a place to live. So we rented about half of the floor, top floor of this building. There's a nice apartment up there. Old building? No, it was actually a new building. Is that right? But it had a great view, because every morning I could point my camera out the window and take a photograph of the job progress. There's the building right over there. Eagle's Eye, huh? Yeah. Now, what time of year did you start the job? Well, we broke ground in February, Ooh. and that was to make sure that we were open June 1st. Because if you miss the season, you're out of business. Yeah, I you guess. might as well not open at all. Well, tell me a little bit about the building. Well, it was a clothing store at the time we opened it, sort of sport-type clothing. Still is. Yeah, and uh, it's actually two masses, a two-story section over here 
and a two-story section over here, identical in size, connected by this little one-story section. Pretty much the same as you built it? Well, they changed the trim color, I know that. Okay, didn't ask your permission? No, it was that <laughs> cottage red, you know, the Nantucket red. And uh, that handicapped ramp wasn't here, but the porch was here, it looks just the same. Well, I don't suppose they'd mind if we took a look around inside? I don't think so. Ooh, nice stuff. Don't want to come in here with a full wallet. <laughs> it will be empty when you leave. <laughs> Is it the way you remember it? Uh, what I remember the most about this building is that it was meant to look like a timber frame. It had these six by six posts and big beams and then joists going across and planking up on the top. No, I don't see any fancy mortise and tenon work on it. Well, I cheated. We used a few metal plates, so don't tell Ted Benson about <laughs> this job. How about in here? Well, now this area, wow, look at this. I had built some cabinetry for that store to display penny candy and they still have it here wow i'm glad i saved that penny on the ferry i can use it <laughs> i guess this candy does really well in these stores now what about all the lumber did you buy it on the island actually i bought everything off island i put it all out to bid and everything came in three loads one big flatbed with all the timber and the framing one with the windows and the shingles and one with the interior trim must give you an eerie feeling to come back to a place that you worked on so long ago. Well, we worked hard, and it's nice to see that the place still looks great. It does look good. Who designed it? Our old friend, Jock Gifford. No kidding. Yeah, in fact, he's supposed to show us around. So where do we find him? Oh, we'll find him over at his restaurant. Restaurant? So what's the deal, Norm? An architectural designer with a restaurant? Well, at the same time I was building the store, Jock leased this building, which happened to be the laundromat for the boat crowd and he converted it into a fancy seafood restaurant. Well, of course, makes perfect sense. <laughs> well, this one has one of those yellow stains in it, so I don't know if you want to use it or Excuse not. Excuse me. No, I don't, yeah. Looking for Jock. Jock Gifford? Yeah. He's not here. He's probably up at Design Associates, mm -hmm. at the bottom of Main Street, top floor of the Pacific Club. All right. right. Okay. Yeah, we can just put these aside here. All right. What a great old building. Yeah. Now, this is one of the oldest surviving buildings in the town. Is that right? And it was a social club for the sea captains who went to the Pacific in search of whales. And when they returned here, they'd play cribbage for hours and hours. Think of the yarns they must have spun. Come in. Hey, Steve. How are you? Good to see you. Good to see Norm. you. Norm. I've been expecting you guys. Come in and sit down. It's been a few years, hasn't it? Since yeah. Kirkside in Whalen. Right. House by the how side did, of the church. Yeah, how do those people like that house? Well, we just saw them recently at the wrap party for our Salem, Massachusetts project, and hey, they were all smiles. Well, that's great. What do we do there? We did the kitchen, mm -hmm. that little screen porch, upstairs uh, master, master bathroom. bathroom. Yeah, great project. That was fun. Yeah. That was fun. No, I understand that you might have a project down here that we would be interested in. Well, it's your call. But I'd like you to take a look at it. It's a, it's a wonderful old house that was built in 1887. Mm -hmm. uh, so that makes it a Victorian. Mm -hmm. It's pristine. It hasn't really been changed since then. Is that right? Um, Are we crazy to be trying to do a project down here in the summer? Well, I think you're lucky because most people want to live in their houses in the summertime here in Nantucket mm -hmm. and not want to construct on it. Uh, but these people just bought the house yeah. uh, a month ago, and they really want to get going. So. What part of town is it in? Well, it's uh, up Main Street, up to the monument on Main Street. Uh, it's not too far from here. Let's take a stroll. Well, Jack, I think Main Street in Nantucket is one of the prettiest streets I've seen anywhere. Well, Steve, a lot of people agree with you. But, Jack, how is it that Nantucket's been able to preserve its historic character? No fast food restaurants, no parking meters, and no ugly signs. All right. Well, there's probably several reasons for it, Norm. The two big ones are that back in the 50s, when Nantucket could have gone the way a lot of seaside resorts went, uh, a man with money and vision stepped in. So that would be Walter Bonnet? Yes, Steve. He uh, bought all of the real estate that he could here. Uh, he then renovated, preserved, uh, and, then, and then sought out tenants who would come in and, uh, you know, big, built businesses here that were uh, supportive of his image of mm -hmm. what he thought Nantucket and the town and the street should be. And what you see is pretty much uh, the result of his, the way he wanted it. Now, there is another reason, and that's the HDC. Historic District Commission. 
That's right. Their mandate is to make sure that every architectural detail here conforms to the period before 1846. That's the year this whole town burned. It's the Great Fire. So they exert an important architectural control on development. Really a critical role, Steve. Hey, Jock, I remember this place, the hub. Yeah, that's where everybody you know gets their newspapers. You know, that newspaper is important when you're 30 miles out to sea. What a great old building. This is the Pacific National Bank. Where is everything called Pacific? We're on the Atlantic Ocean. Well, this town made its fortune in whaling, in whale oil. The ships left Nantucket. They went and caught the whales in the Pacific and brought them back here in the form of oil. Hmm. Now I get it. Well, the cobbles on the streets really add character. Do these cobblestones come over as ballast on ships? Actually, that's a very popular misconception. The truth is that the town decided to pave its dusty streets. They brought these cobblestones over from a city in Boston, Gloucester, in 1837. 87. Two years before that, this ship owner, Charles Coffin, built this house, 1835. And I think what's really notable is this fence. Uh, it's a Jeffersonian wheat fence. So these represent sheaths of wheat? Yes. Hmm. Made out of wood? Yep. I could build that. Now, these three houses are known the world over as the three bricks. Yeah, that's right. Uh, between 1837 and 1840, a man that could only be described as a whaling mogul built these three fabulous houses for his three sons. Hmm. And then in 1844, he built a house across the street here for his daughter, the Hawden House. Now, that is a generous father. Boy, I'll say. Well, now, this is the top of Main Street. And it's actually my old neighborhood when I was a kid. Oh, yeah? Yeah, the, the, the house across the street with the grapevines on it, that was my grandfather's house. My uncle lives there now. And someday, I'd really love to show you through it. This monument is the Civil War monument. We call it the Soldiers and Sailors Monument. And just a couple of hundred feet down the road here is the house that I really want you to look at. Well, this is it. A sweet little building, don't you think? Yeah. Nice and simple. I love that 12-pitch roof, too. Now, there's a little bit of Victorian detail over that center window, but, Jock, the front of the house is shingled. I would have expected clapboard. Well, I'm sure it would have been originally clapboard in Norm. And yet the side of the house is still a clapboard. Yeah, well, that, that's really why the front would have been clapboarded, too. So do you think this is original? Yes. But I don't think these vinyl shutters are original. <laughs> no. And you know, the HDC would never approve of those nowadays. Yeah, but they would approve of keeping those nice little gingerbread brackets above the window. Oh, they'd insist on it. Aren't they sweet little? Yeah, they look great. What is this big window, Jock? Is there like a basement apartment or something? No, I'm afraid it's just the window to the basement, Steve. No, I don't like this well, though, Steve. Moisture, insects, mm. nothing but trouble. You know, the backyard is not big by Nantucket, by suburban standards, but it's huge by Nantucket standards. Yeah, it really is. Now, what's going on out here, Jock? It looks like a little construction. Well, the neighbor's building a fence, hmm. and I think what it's going to do is really ensure that uh, we have a nice, private little backyard here. How about this little bump out? What's that? Well, that's, that's originally the kitchen to the house. Yeah. Huh. And what about this little shed? Well, I think my best guess, Norm, is that this was originally a chicken coop or so, something like that. Yeah, not in very good shape right now. No. Hey, but down here, you could run it out. Now, this leads into the basement, I guess? Right. A little head-knocking entrance to the, uh, to the basement. And we can check that out later. It starts to get a little nasty back here. Yeah. yeah. I don't like this big old tree here hanging over this corner of the building. That starts to cause a lot of trouble. Yeah, and you can see that the, the, there's been water problems on the ground. The, 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 we've eroded away to below the parging line. Wow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it is nice to see that the house is sitting way up above grade. The wood is way up there. It shouldn't have any sill problems. Right? No, I think from that standpoint, the house is in very good shape, Norm. How about all the windows, Jock? Do you figure they're original? Yes, I think they are. I noticed that the uh, paint is not in very good condition. It seems to be really flaking and peeling off just about everywhere. Well, you know, it's, you know, Nantucket is very humid. It's a tough environment. It's hard to keep paint on the building. It takes yeah. a lot of maintenance. Yeah. Now, do you have a key, Jock? Can we take a look inside? Sure, sure. Just hop over the fence. All right. Well, 
Well, you can see here the front pole is a little tight. Ooh, I'll say. And the uh, simple banister here. A little bit of an unusual pattern. This must have been the carpenter's choice. Right. This is the front parlor. This would have been the fancy room in the house. Nice plaster medallion. You can still see the fittings for a gas lamp. This bay window is nice. It lets a lot of light in here, and you get a great view of the whole street. Yeah, notice the uh, plaster molding, which is ornate, much more ornate than you would have expected in a house like this. Mm. Boy, you can feel this floor going down right away. What's going on here? Looks like there's a little rod around this radiator pipe. You think that was leaking? Probably for a long time, Norm. Mm. That's not good. You figure this was the dining room, John? Actually, I think it was just the back parlor, uh, the second parlor. You can see that we uh, they ran uh, nice fancy fir wood around the, the edge of the room and left the center of the room uh, with just spruce wood. Boy, they didn't waste a nickel on shellac. No, but it would have been covered with a carpet. Of course. What was this room? Well, I don't know what this room was, Steve, uh, but you can see it got simple. We just have a pine floor here. Yeah, nice wide pine boards. Even the casework is very simple, just flat casings. All right, now this would have been the dining room, Steve, I think. Again, mm. they left the center of the room unfinished. We have a uh, chandelier and a little china cupboard. Now, is this it on the bathrooms, Chuck? Do you need more than one, Steve? <sighs> Depends how many people were living here, I guess. Well, I think there were, it's right off the dining room, and there were nine people living in this house for most of its life. Wow. Hmm. Now, this is the, uh, the kitchen. Oh, boy. <laughs> Whoa. Hey, just a little paint and paper, right, Norm? Right. Fix it right up. You gotta be kidding, Josh. You like it? <laughs> what was the uh, asking price on this place? Well, it was listed for $505,000. Half a million dollars? That is a lot of money. Mm. You guys haven't even seen the second floor yet. Whew. Well, this tour really won't take very long. Uh, and what I really like about this house, I think you can see, it's just, this is the way it was built. They haven't remodeled it. Nothing has really changed since, since the day it was built. This is the back bedroom, which is a pretty good-sized bedroom. Views of the backyard. Lots of light. Good-sized closet. Yeah. Nice pine floors. Yeah. Now, this room is, I'm not sure what it was, a common room, a, a bedroom, an upstairs parlor. And they have a little bit of an unfinished storage space back here. That can be useful. Now, there's another bedroom up front. Yes, this is, I think, what would have been the master bedroom. It's right above the front parlor, you know, on the, on the street side. Mm -hmm. So, how long did this hang around in the market, Joe? A long time? Actually, Steve, it was snapped up like wow. that. Got to meet these homeowners. And I got to meet Bruce Killen, a contract. I got to see what he thinks of this place. Okay. Well, listen, I'll be back at my office. Just let me know. Okay. All Thanks, right. Chuck. I think this is the nicest view, Norm. Wow. This is some house. How long is this place? 235 feet. Wow. And look at the view. Ocean view with lots of open land. I like that. Now, when did you do this job? Three years ago. It was a renovation and new. The existing form was from that end to here. New from there on. Wow, you blended the old and the new together perfectly. It looks great. Now, tell me about this land. Is it going to stay open like this, or are we going to have other houses coming up in front of here? This land is in conservation hands. It's forever wild. That's great. Now, we came here to see what you can do with wood. How about showing me that kitchen you were talking about earlier? Come on inside. Down these three stairs, and we're into the family kitchen. Great. Wow, what a view. Nice table. Nice place to have lunch. And here's where we make lunch. Boy, Bruce, what a job. Longleaf pine? You bet. Quarter sign. Now, uh, who made the cabinets? Well, we made them out at the shop. That's right. You do have a fully equipped shop here. And how about these trusses? Well, we built them on site. Uh, sort of a fun detail, Norm, is that we sprung a batten on them and sawed them on the bandsaw to give a maritime curve to it. Huh, does the job. Now, you got some really nice details. Glass front doors. Custom plate rack, granite sink and countertops, the commercial oven, and you've even used the longleaf pine to conceal the appliances. The owners must be really happy. I think they like it. Great. What a great space. 
Now, Bruce, these didn't come out of your shop. No, Norm, these came from the wreck of the Seven Master Scooter, the Wyoming. Salvage from a shipwreck. We don't waste anything around here. Now, listen, Bruce, we're thinking about doing a house down on Milk Street. Oh, the, uh, the White Victorian, the old Conway house? That's right. Interested in helping us? I'd love to. Building downtown in the middle of summer can be a real nightmare with mm -hmm. the traffic and the people. Uh, but that's got that nice big side yard, doesn't that's it? That's right. Plenty of room for the trucks. What's the budget like? I don't really know, but I can tell you this. It's not as big as the budget was on this job. <laughs> but the good news is Jock Gifford's the designer. Oh, great, Jock. This must be an exciting day. It is exciting. Sure is. First house on Nantucket? It's our first house in Nantucket. Wow. Well, Kathy, what do you do? I used to practice law. Now I'm at home with my children. Well, that's a full-time job. It is. And Craig? I'm a financial consultant, and I do some work with a software development company in Massachusetts. Oh. You have a home elsewhere, right? That's correct. We live outside of Boston. So this will primarily be used for weekends? Primarily for now, but we'll consider possibly moving down here. Yeah. Well, it's a nice yeah. island. Thanks. You have what most Nantucketers don't seem to have, which is a great patch of land back here. Well, that's right. We were pleased to find a house in this location with some land because in the historic district, most of the lots are quite small, and to have a yard like this with our small children was really a great mm. find for us. Well, let's go inside and go through your wish great. list. Well, first on my list would be the kitchen. Well, you don't want to cook gourmet meals in this one? Uh, as you can see, there's not much here. <laughs> so you want a new one? We sure do. Yeah. And I'd love to find a way to open this up so we get some more light in here and get a view out of that nice yard. Makes sense to me. Now, the house only has one bathroom. It's down here. No, I have to be in It's pretty small. It needs help. And we'd also like to add a couple others. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And this room, Steve, uh, we thought would make a nice downstairs bedroom, probably a guest room, and if there was some space, we might want to try to add a little bathroom or add access to that larger bathroom yeah. where you do it. Well, once the word gets out, you've got a place on the Antarctic. <laughs> you're going to have a lot of friends. I think we'll hear from some people, yes. Well, this is our favorite room in the house. Really like it. Yeah, from an architectural standpoint, I think it's wonderful. Now, I've got to ask you, what kind of budget are you thinking of working with on this project? Well, most of the houses in this area have been renovated and carry price tags now of 700000 to well over a million. So. I think realistically, we're probably looking at a couple hundred thousand dollars. To do I'd agree with right. that. I'd agree with that. Well, it just so happens we know one of the best architectural designers on the island. And right now, Norm is checking out one of the best builders on the island. So why don't we put our heads together and get back to you? It would be great if you could help us. Yeah, it'd be great working with you. So let's take a look upstairs. OK. You coming, Morgan? So Norm, how did you make out? Well, Bruce is willing and able. All right. And he showed me some great work. Well, the homeowners are eager to get going, and they've got some money to spend. Ah, that's good to hear. So, should we do it? I think so. Even if it means spending most of the summer down here in Nantucket? Well, it's a tough job, but somebody's got to do it. Next time, Richard Trithui will be down to check out the systems and give us what I think will be bad news. So until then, I'm Steve Thomas. And I'm Norm Abram for this old house. Hey, I hear that the bluefish are starting to run. You got your pole? Yeah. All right. Funding for this old house is provided by State Farm Insurance, keeping our promise of protection to generation after generation. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Glidden Paint. For over 120 years, Glidden has been bringing American homes to life. Glidden, bringing your home to life. And by. When it comes to tough hand tools, we're making a name for ourselves. Because they're made with a full lifetime warranty. That's Ace, the name to know for hand tools. Production of WGBH, Boston. To order video cassette copies of this old house, call 1 800 255 9424 or write to the address on your screen.
This is PBS. To order this old house companion books, call 1-800-255-9424. Fully illustrated with color photos and diagrams, these soft cover editions present all aspects of kitchen and bathroom design and renovation, and home heating and cooling. These books are $24.95 each, or order the set of three books for $65, plus shipping and handling. Broadcasting from Orange County, this is KOCE. Expand your mind. It was a diverse and ragtag group of over 40 men sent out to discover the country's future. They were frontiersmen. Give me lead, give me powder, and give me a good rifle, and I can get through anything. But not without luck, coincidence, and the help of a young Shoshone woman. She's called a lot of different names. Sacagawea, Sacagawea. She's pregnant when they hire her. They banded together, fighting the current and the elements. The whole thing is right on the edge. They're nearly starving. Tense meetings with Indians, some friendly and some not. They came and they decided what to do. Let's kill them. They encountered nature's wildest beauty and angriest fury. Yet the most damage came from within. Lewis disintegrated. He fell apart. Director Ken Burns presents Lewis and Clark. Sunday morning at 11.30. Relive the days of World War II with Danger UXB. Tales of courageous men who risked their lives disarming bombs that rained on England. Sunday at 8 on KOCE. Oh boy. It's amazing how many stars there are. You know what's really amazing, Clell? Is that recent discoveries within the Orion Nebula lend credence to the theory of a whole other solar system, predating our own, of course, thus increasing the chances of our 